Um, I, I tell you, I had a lot of fun putting this together. I hope you have a lot of fun listening to it. You can tell me afterward. So just a, by way of introduction, so I've been around the oil and gas industry for 47 years now, it seems, um, not counting school. Uh, so 33 years with Shell. I started life there as a geophysicist, ended up as a vice president. Uh, I'll still claim to be a geophysicist if you ask me a hard question that's outside of geophysics. I'll just say, well, I'm a geophysicist, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I'll point to John or Charles, let them answer. Um, after after uh, Shell, I did a few things. I was involved with the National Oil Spill Commission as chief scientist investigating the BP Deepwater Horizon uh, blowout and spill. Uh, I was visiting scientists at MIT, and then for 10 years, just now ended, I was an adjunct professor at Stanford in energy resources engineering, teaching co courses mostly in in energy and energy industry, and in in particularly the oil business, how they're organized, what they do, what they care about, what they don't care about. And uh, anyway, so through all of this, I, I, it turns out I've learned some stuff. And, and I enjoy sharing it. And, and I enjoy kind of putting the pieces together into a bigger story. And that's what I've tried to do with, um, with this. You know, if I, if I take the economics of deep water, if, if you want the five second version, it's easy. High rate, high ultimate wells, moderate oil price, go for it. You're done. And, but of course, there's more to it than that. And it's the more to it than that that, that makes it fun to think about. And, and, and a bigger story, and really, I'll tell you, one of the punchlines that we'll get to many times through here, but certainly by the end, look, deep water is deep water, but it's the oil business. All right? it, it's, it's unique because, well, because it's deep water. It's not Oklahoma. It's not the San Joaquin Valley. It's not the Williston Basin. It's deep water. It's not the shelf. It's deep water. But it's still the oil business. And, and we'll see lots of examples of why it, it, it's best actually just think about it as the oil business and, and then understand what the special circumstances are that, that go with deep water. So for starters, well, since deep water is in the talk, let's start with this. There has always been deep water. In 1901, deep water was anything beyond the shoreline. Right? This is the first offshore production in the U.S., Summerland, California. It's uh, just south of Santa Barbara. Uh, you can go there today. The platforms are all gone. They got wiped out in a storm about 10 years after this picture was taken. Uh, but deep water was anything beyond the beach. Ultra deep water was anything out here at 30 feet or more where it didn't pay to build piers. That was the world of 1901. And there's been deep water ever since then. It's just sort of progressively moved out. Now, if we, if we think about deep water, an important thing is there is no SI definition of deep water. So if, if you talk, to deep, talk about deep water with different people, just ask them what, what they think deep water is. For John, it's any, any turbidite anywhere in the world. It can be on the top of a mountain. He didn't care. That's fine. That's good. As long as you know, that's his definition of deep water. For most of my life at Shell, we, we like to say 1,500 feet, water depth. Okay. A lot of people say 1,000. Some people say 600. It turns out, you can say 600, 1,000, doesn't much matter. There's not a lot of geography around, around the globe between, 1, 000, between 600 feet water depth and 1,500. And so it's about the same world. But, but anyway, just deep water is whatever you want it to be. Uh, but when you're talking to somebody about deep water, just make sure uh, that you, you know what they're talking about. So what I'm going to do here, um, I'm going to, these things, I want to talk about deep water as part of the business, the nature of deep water, the nature of the oil and gas business, why, why it makes sense to think of it that way. I look at organization, economics, technology. Economics will come up. There's not, no spreadsheets in here, but there, there are some numbers. I do like to talk about dogmas and, and sort of prevailing wisdom, what people are saying, what they're not saying, what, what everybody thinks is the answer before they actually know. Uh, we'll, we'll have some of that. And uh, I'll look forward at the future uh, of deep water as well. Now, the first important thing in this story, well, actually, before I get to the first important thing, I got another important thing. It's not on the slide, it's on paper. It turns out 
that Houston Geologic Society, in October of 1988, had a speaker. His name was Tom Hart. Tom was a longtime executive at Shell, geologist, was exploration vice president. In, in this talk, Tom, Tom opened it with talking about his experience over the years, as I kind of did the openness, and then said, but what a dynamic period, I'm, I'm reading from, from his talk, what a dynamic period this has been for a petroleum geologist. The oil business emerged from the doldrums of World War II and exploded into the high-tech business it is today. Geologists rode the crest of a technology wave unprecedented in height and breadth in the history of the science. And the beauty of our science is that technology breakthroughs are expressed as new thoughts and ideas that we can put to work immediately. We don't have to make new machine tools. We don't have to build factories. We don't have to structure huge capital formations. We can take advantage of our new ideas to improve the business immediately. And I found this when I was searching through my huge stacks of things in my office. And I was like, you know, this is the same today. This is, Tom said this in 1980. Now, now I give Tom credit for it. Actually, I had something to do with writing this with him. Uh, but but it, it's just as true today as it was in 1988. We're, we're in a business that continues to grow and expand. It's driven by technology, technology changes, and it's pretty spectacular what we're able to do with technology. And we'll come back to a few ex more examples of that as we go. Now, back to deep water. The first most important thing is it does not live in a vacuum. Deep water is deep water. And deep water oil production is just fine, but it turns out that the oil you might produce from deep water, this actually isn't from deep water, this is from uh, the UK North Sea, but no matter. Nobody actually wants this stuff. It, it's lovely and it smells good, but if you're the right kind of person, I suppose. Um, <laughs> By, by the way, if you go back to Summerland, there's a, there's a nice little park there, and you can walk down to the beach, and it smells also good. There seeps everywhere up and down the coast there. So uh, there's, there's no surprise that people were drilling for oil along the coast there. In any case, um, nobody actually wants crude oil. What people want is the products that are made from it. Fuels, plastics, petrochemicals. And, and so the deep water, as part of this big business, has to survive as part of this business. It doesn't, doesn't, has no intrinsic value of its own. Its value is what we can do with what we produce from the deep water. And that's important to remember, right? Because that, that will frame, uh, particularly when we think about it from an economic standpoint. Now, let's go back to the oil business uh, and put deep water in perspective. This is the oil business, 100 years of the oil industry. Now, spindle top, by the way, some of you may have heard some of this before because I sprinkle these things in, in lots of different talks. That's okay because chances are you'll remember it better. I'll remember it better. Uh, but look, spindle top was a huge moment in, in, in this industry. It is, in my mind, the beginning of the oil industry, the modern day oil industry. When, when the, the, the first well blew out at spindle top, U.S. oil production at that very moment, that well blew out and it's estimated it was flowing something like 100,000 barrels a day from like 1,000 feet <laughs> drilling depth. That's pretty, pretty spectacular, 100,000 barrels a day. At that moment, U.S. domestic oil production tripled. It went from 50 to 150 at that very moment. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And in the year following Spindle Top, there are something like 1,500 oil companies were chartered in the United States to go after this business. That's how significant it was uh, for the industry uh, and the development of the industry. Fast forward 100 years. By the way, Spindle Top is about 160, 170 million barrel field. There are a few wells still producing today. It's pretty interesting. Fast forward 100 years, and we have things like the Nikika production facility in 6,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. Nikika, as a group of fields, approaches a billion barrels. It's at least 600 million, depends on what you add up. Ultimately, it's probably gonna be pretty close to a billion barrels. With that kind of footprint compared to that, that's something else very significant about this industry and how it's advanced. And the fact that, okay, it's not onshore in East Texas, 
is out in 6,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and there are facilities like this elsewhere in the world. It's very, very significant. This is, this is just the, the most dramatic example of, of how an industry has evolved. Okay, 100 years is a long time, but this is pretty, pretty spectacular stuff. Now, you know, since, since economics is in the talk, title, I picked it, I guess. Um, like a lot of things, you pick the title before you actually put it together. So you, you kind of have to keep coming back to it because I promised I'd talk about economics. Okay, we can't talk about economics without at least saying something about oil price. So here's oil price. This is from uh, what was the BP Statistical Review. is still now the Statistical Review. I just can't remember who publishes it now. But it's still, it's still easy to find online. And it, for those students in particular, if you have not seen the Statistical Review of World Energy, go online, search for it, find it, and, and look through it every year because it compiles so much information about energy, hydrocarbons, oil and gas, coal, nuclear, renewables. It, it brings it all together in one place. And, and just the, one of the greatest things about it is BP's been, and, and the current group that's doing it now, they've been doing it now for 70 plus years. And so there's a lot of consistency. You can find, you can search, you can find old versions of it. You can find the very first one that was published 70 some years ago. And it's amazing to look and see how the world of energy has evolved. And, and so every year in June when this comes out, um, I, I go and I, I print it and I start pouring through it and I look at it and, and see how things have changed over the course of the year. Anyway, that's where this plot comes from. And, and it's a useful plot. So here we have from 1861, to today, basically. Uh, the dark line at the bottom is the price of oil. Um, the scales on the right, it goes from zero to 140. So these are $10 increments. Uh, the, the dark line at the bottom is the price of oil in the day, in the dollars of the day. So interesting, oil spent a lot of time at, at prices less than $10 a barrel until we get into the 70s and then a few jumps and then down jumps and some high numbers and there are some low numbers. The yellow line is if we take those dollars of the day and, and correct them for inflation from whenever that was. And, and well, this is a year old slide, so it puts them into 2022 dollars, so essentially today dollars. So you can see. Oil has spent most of history of this industry at pretty moderate prices. Now, there, we could talk a lot about oil price. I don't talk a lot about oil price because oil price doesn't actually determine success and failure in this industry. Oil price is good for some things, but only for some things. Good oil fields are good oil fields regardless of price. A good oil field at $100 a barrel, I guarantee you, is a good oil field at $40 a barrel. A bad oil field at $40 a barrel is still a bad oil field at $100 a barrel. You might make money, you might have positive cash flow at least, but it's still a bad oil field. There's something wrong with it. Too hot, too deep, too sour, too tight. Something, there's something bad. Right? So good oil fields are good oil fields. At, at a, over a very wide range of oil prices. That's the first most important thing. Second most important thing, price is not an existential threat for well-run oil companies. Now, there's a little footnote on that. Look, if you're a, a small independent, focus geographically or geologically, price can be a make or break thing for it. I don't, I don't, I'm not pretending that's not true. But particularly for the majors, the international oil companies, large independents, those with a portfolio, those that understand the importance of a good, oil, what a good oil field means, price is not an existential threat for these companies. Forget what you hear in the media. They don't know what they're talking about. By the way, there'll be a lot of that as a theme as we go through the night. Now, you want, you want proof that price is not an existential threat? Well, here it is. Shell, ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP, Total, ConocoPhillips. This is how long they've been in business. They've seen it all. They've seen high oil price, they've seen the low oil price. And by the way, almost every year, all of those companies have made money. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But they've never been in danger of bankruptcy because they've run their business knowing that that's what oil price does. You don't, you don't try to predict it. 
You try to manage your business so that you survive regardless. And you do that by, where have I heard this before? Good oil fields and good gas fields too. So that's important. Now there's another thing about price. And that's, we hear a lot about price driving the business. Well, no, not really. You know, when we look at, at, at that oil price, funny thing, exploration, good exploration is not oil price driven. And, and global reserves respond very weakly to all those price signals. Global, the global reserve, uh, reserves over production ratio. How many years can I continue at the rate I'm producing today? When I started in the industry, it was about 30. 20 years later, in the early to mid-90s, it was 40. Today, it's about 50. 50 years. So with all of those ups and downs and wild swings and the, and the doom and gloom and demise and peak oil and everything else, we're finding a whole lot more at higher rates. And we're producing a whole lot more than we were 40 years ago as well. So these are kind of important things that are sort of totally independent of price. Another thing that, that price has very little to do with, but by the way, I, I felt <coughs> compelled to put this in. When you listen to experts tell you what is happening or is going to happen, be careful. Be very careful. So experts, experts over the life of this industry have said, there is no oil to be found in, and there's a list. In the, in the 1880s, there was no oil to be found in California. In the 1890s, there's no oil to be found in Texas. Prior to Spindle Top, oil was an Appalachian thing. Yeah? Oil Creek, Pennsylvania, and through the Appalachians, and that's, that's where the oil is. Oh, and Kazakhstan, a few other places. No, look, it's, it's just not a, it's not a west or the Mississippi thing at all. Until somebody starts drilling wells and they find well, that's not true. In the 1950s and 60s, everybody knew there was no oil to be found in North Alaska. Shell specifically was not interested in the sale where Prudhoe Bay was, was sold because, well, we'd been to Alaska. We'd looked around. We went down into the Brooks Range. We saw all of those rocks in outcrop in the Brooks Range and they're tombstone. There's not, there's going to be no porosity on the, on the coast. It's just, no, there's no oil in North Alaska. We knew that. Oh, by the way, I, I will refer to shell things a lot. We're not the only ones that made mistakes. It's just the ones I, I happen to know because I hung around the company for a while. In 1970 or so, Shell's global head of exploration said, I will drink every drop of oil that you produce from the North Sea. Now he said that because he was not happy that Shell had to go to the initial sale uh, lease offering from the UK government in 1964 and, and pick up wide, wide swaths of acreage. Uh, we had to do it because we had gas production in the southern basin. We wanted to protect that from a uh, government relationship standpoint and be seen as a good partner for the governments. Okay, so, so we partnered up with Exxon and, and after, if you're interested, I'll tell you two great stories about the North Sea, but I'm not gonna slow them in here. But, but we went anyway and okay, so be it. 40 billion barrels later. And, and through the 1980s into the early, even into the early 90s, everybody knew there was nothing to be found in deep water. It's just, it's just uh, uh, let's see, I need to find a button to push to get rid of that. There. This is what the expert said. Experts not so expert. Everybody's an expert before the fact. The USGS and various industry experts have also said repeatedly we're running out of oil. And, and by the way, when I quote headlines and things in here, the reason my binder is so thick is I've made copies. So I can prove to you that Indeed, this is what people were saying. So anyway, document. The first time the USGS said the US is running out of oil was 1926, and has been saying it ever since. Up until the early 2000s, 2005, 6, 7 time frame, 
when peak oil was in vogue and lots of people, lots of industry experts were saying we're running out of oil. All through this time period, our over P has been increasing dramatically. But the experts have had a story to tell. Go figure. Now let's come back and look at the business. Talk about exploration a little bit. Because this is, really this is, a, when I talk about deep water, I'll sort of fall back into my, my life as an exploration professional and talk about it this way. When we, when we look at, at the US, so this, the, the axes here are years, 1900 on the left, 2020 on the right, and what we're looking at is a plot of approximate, approximate um, US lower 48 crude oil reserves as given by the Energy Information Administration, the federal government. So the data is good. It's approximate because I took a few things out to make it lower 48. But, but why I say lower 48 is because the lower 48 is this, it basically is a free-for-all. There, there are thousands of companies, big and small, very big to very small. They all get to do what they want, try different things, experiment, try technologies, succeed, fail. The whole. It's just this great free-for-all. So it's this very, very vibrant, open, dynamic marketplace. And so what you see is something that's, that's much more related to geology and technology than governments parceling out acreage or something like that. Right. So here's what, here's what the picture looks like. I could put the arrows on here for when we were running out of oil all the time. But prominently, you know, we were supposed to, it was all going to be over in here, but no matter. Now, we look at this, and it's not a monolith. There's lots of different things that have been going on. It started, I separated into five phases when I think about the history of exploration. The first phase from Drake, peaking around 1915, 1920 the seismic method was invented. So it's really before that and a little bit after. What, what was the industry doing? The industry was drilling the, the, what they thought was, was a subsurface target based on something they saw at the surface. Now, back here, that was mostly seats. Oil Creek, Pennsylvania was called Oil Creek for a reason. And a lot of seeps on the California coast and elsewhere were drilled. And actually, a fair amount of oil was discovered. And it was in 1890 that, is it Dr. I.C. White? I think that was his name. 1882, when he first published, promoted his anticlinal theory of, of oil and gas accumulation. And the industry didn't like it at first, nobody liked it at first, but it caught on. And so by 1900, the industry was actually out drilling the surface expression of what they thought would be subsurface anticlines, because that's where where it was seen to be oil. And a lot of oil was found this way. Now, you know, drilling, drilling for structures is pretty straightforward. You're on the Gulf Coast, you're looking for North Dip. You're in the Powder River Basin, you're looking for East Dip. In the Uintas, you're looking for South Dip. In the Anadarko, it's North Dip. San Joaquin Valley, it's West Dip. You're, you're, you're trying to find where the prevailing dip turns over and you establish a sandline. And a lot of oil was discovered drilling these surface expressions of anticlines. Now some of these anticlines on the surface are pretty dramatic. This happens to be my favorite. If you've never been to the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, go and stand there where the Shoshone River cuts through the, big, the Sheep Mountain anticline and just marvel at, at this. It's pretty impressive. There are a few gas fields down dip in both directions. But this is pretty, pretty impressive stuff. There are a lot of other things that are pretty impressive that were found drilling the surface expressions of anticlines. Not quite so impressive on the surface, but pretty impressive in the subsurface when they're drilled. And this is one of them. This is the largest oil spill ever in probably in the world, certainly in the United States. This is 1910. That's a discovery well at Midway Sunset Field. It flowed for 544 days. 
and um, estimated 9.4 million barrels of oil was spilled. What they did was they quickly got bulldozers and built dikes all around and contained it and then pumped it out and sent it off to the refineries on the west coast and in Los Angeles. And if you go there today, you can actually find the surface casing for the Midway Sunset Field. And, and if you poke around, all of the rock around the surface casing is this really marvelous oil-soaked sandstone. And then you get the bigger piece. If you break it in half, it's just marvelous stuff. It was soaked with oil 100 years ago. And, and there, it's still there, just for the pickings. Three billion barrels of oil has been produced from the Midway Sunset Field since, uh, since this uh, well came in. By the way, 1910, they didn't call it a blowout. The well came in. Right. Um, three billion barrels has been produced, and another 500 plus million is still in the ground to be produced. So it's a pretty spectacular field. Okay, that takes us through the first phase. Then we get into seismic. Well, seismic. What do we do with seismic? Well, I was doing the same. We're doing the same thing with seismic we were doing before seismic, uh, except now I had a better look at the subsurface. I didn't have to infer from what I saw on the surface. I could kind of actually look beneath my feet. And so more points of control, not just imagining and a few bits of the wells I had, but now I've got the seismic method to help. And, and the seismic method, as it's developed over the years, has been pretty spectacular. And it's not only allowed us to, to okay, I can, I can do um, structural traps, but I can also do stratigraphic traps. And, 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 and the sort of the whole mindset of exploration has, has developed since then. And then the seismic tool has been available at first onshore and then phase three when the seismic technology moved offshore. And, and now it's developed today into these very, very uh, extensive, very dense 3D surveys and 4D surveys, pretty spectacular. And then the fourth wave deep water, which came about uh, really in the 1980s and, and it's a pretty significant wave. And then, the, and then the fifth wave going on right now, which is shale. Now you may like or dislike any one of these, that's okay. But they're all unique, they're all different, they all have their strengths, they all have their weaknesses, they're all the oil business. And, and the, the interesting thing about them is um, they, they didn't just happen. They happened, I contend, because somebody actually believed something might be there worth doing. Now a lot of people would say, well, no, but look at all that stuff people were saying about the deep water. Um, obviously, no one really thought there was something in the deep water. Well, actually, I, I don't know. Somebody believed in it because in uh, the mid-80s, the early 80s, 1982, 83, Shell put our brand new shiny seismic boat to work, acquiring proprietary 3D data over the deep water Gulf of Mexico in advance of the first area-wide sale in 1984, where we bought auger and Mars and lots of other very, very nice fields. This was a huge investment. Somebody actually believed there might be something out there. No, didn't know exactly what it was, didn't know how good it was gonna be, but somebody believed that there might be something there. Pretty, pretty important. And, and if I go back to the current wave, just as a, as a side, is shale really a surprise? Lots of people seem to act surprised about shale. Well, I hold in my hands a Xerox copy. Now, youngsters, you don't know what a Xerox copy is, but we used to have these machines <laughs> called Xerox machines from the Xerox Corporation, and they would make copies. And then, and so Xerox became its own little noun. So I, and so this is an actual Xerox copy of an article from the Houston Chronicle dated February 9, 1981. The National Petroleum Council report on unconventional gas where they estimate, it says right here, five to 600 billion cubic feet is ultimately producible from tight reservoirs in the United States, unconventional gas. And they specifically mentioned Devonian shales. Go figure. So you know, it was, these things are not surprises to everybody. It's obviously, some people get surprised by it, but they're, they're not surprised, surprised to everybody. So now what's the deal? Okay, well look, we got these five phases. I could take them apart, I could talk about each one independently, they're all interesting stories. 
But I'm here to talk about the deep water, so let's look at the deep water. Now, here is where, because this picture comes from John Rosine, it comes out of the deep water book. It's compiled by uh, Macon and others. Um, this is actually deep water reservoirs, wherever they may be. Right? Onshore, offshore, doesn't much matter. Okay, so going back to, to the late 19th century. But this is on the scale, the vertical scales, cumulative reserves from deep water reservoirs from 1890 uh, today. So what was going on? Um, up, up to the 1970s and even into the 1980s. Well, most everybody was saying that this is not, nothing very attractive about this. Yeah, there are some discoveries, things like cognac and bullwinkle, but these are sort of shelf reservoirs. The water happens to be a little bit deeper. They're, they're not, they're, they're tough because the shelf reservoirs are not that great. Um, these are difficult economically. You should find a really big field. Early deep water drilling on the shelf, it, drilling for the deep water facies below shelf fields, found no sand. So there was a lot of wells that had been drilled. And, and, and actually, when you get out over the shelf edge, the first dozen or so wells drilled in actual deep water today were all dry holes. It turns out they found a lot of sand, but, but no, no shows, no traps, no complete hydrocarbon system. So it was generally perceived to be limited potential offshore in a deep water. Little sand, no active petroleum system. Now what's curious about this, and, and by the way, this, this mindset extended right on into the mid to late 1980s. What's curious about it is, really? So in 1983, the deep sea drilling project actually took some cores uh, off the, uh, the Mississippi Delta. And two of them in particular, 621, which is 150, 140, 150 miles from the shelf edge, and 615, which is 310 miles from the shelf edge. And here's what those cores look like. No, there's no sand in deep water. There's gravel. <laughs> Good grief. You know, long, this business has always been one where we look at the present to inform us about the past. That's one of the things that we do. We, we go out and look what's happening today. And we, okay, the same thing certainly was probably happening in the past. Well, look, these are modern day deposits. This is in the first um, 500 meters below the seabed, well, in the first you know, 500 meters below the seabed, but look, gravels and, and abundant sand. So there's plenty of sand beyond the shelf edge. We just had convinced ourselves, eh. So, here we have a case where there, there's lots of evidence to suggest that prevailing wisdom isn't right, and most people in the industry happily ignored it. My friend Rufus LeBlanc would refer to this as big medicine, by the way. So, well, let's fast forward a decade or two into the late 90s, early 2000s. What the industry analysts were saying was, okay, you've made some discoveries in the Gulf of Mexico. That's fine. But, you know, it's really a Gulf of Mexico thing. Sure, you got auger. Sure, you got marsh. It's a Gulf of Mexico thing. And countries around the world sort of believed that. And when they started licensing deep water, this is Angola. This is Brazil. This is Nigeria. This is any number of countries. Philippines. Uh, they gave very, very attractive terms to the industry to take licenses in deep water provinces around the world because the perceived risk was very high, mostly because of what people were saying. Besides that, we're back to oil price. Oil price was low, and the analysts were saying, eh, deep water is too expensive. You can't make money in the deep water. Now, that's what the industry analysts were saying. The operators and the geoscientists were saying something very different. Deepwater basins are underexplored. We don't understand them. We haven't really sampled them. We don't know what's going on. We've done enough to be, and they're actually, by the way, I've got the articles here. Operators saying, we don't believe that deep water will ultimately be constrained by technology. We don't know quite where the geologic basement is, but we don't think we found it yet. And very importantly, we've never, ever seen wells and reservoirs like this before. This is a high rate, high ultimate well. 
20, 30, 40, 50,000 barrels a day. When we developed Augur, we built a tension lake platform, we shall, with 48 well slots to produce 60 some thousand barrels a day because we planned for shelf-like production rates. We used eight slots of the 48 initially. And the other 48 were great because we had them for, for tiebacks for fields that we found in the vicinity. That's how good the deep water was compared to what we kind of thought we might have based on shelf analogs. Pretty, pretty impressive. But this is the deep water. Now, it, that doesn't make the deep water magic. It just means that, look, this is a characteristic of the deep water. To go with three, four, five thousand 5,000 feet of water, you might find really, really spectacular reservoirs. If I go back to the previous slide, the industry analysts, operators, energy scientists, these are two groups that are living in two different worlds, clearly. And, and if you live through it, and I did live through this, they, they were living in two different worlds. Pretty amazing. All right, let's fast forward again. Now we're into the early 2000s. Deep water discoveries continue, big discoveries in many more provinces around the world, big discoveries in Brazil, big discoveries in Angola, big discoveries in Malaysia, big discoveries in the Philippines, big discoveries in Nigeria, big discoveries in West Shetland, off in the UK, continental shelf, big discoveries, and more in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, hey, maybe the two communities will come together. Well, the industry analysts, some, were saying, okay, yeah, 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 significant global discoveries, but look at here, look at here, look, 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 look. You see how this, you see how this flattens out up here, the deep water's creamed, it's over. You found them all, it's done. That's what they were saying. Significant discoveries, but the deep water is creamed. The deep water is not sustainable. And, oh, by the way, look at oil price. You can't make money in deep water. Go figure. That's what they were saying. My favorite of all of these was a particular analyst who really disliked Shell. Global integrated oils, deep water exploration. Is the deep water dead and buried? This is from 2003. And I tell you, the most annoying thing about this character was I continually had to go talk to my bosses about why he was wrong. It, it really was frustrating. All right, but this is what the analysts, the in, some of the industry analysts, stock market analysts is what they're saying. Operators and geoscientists, well, guess what? Oh, and a few analysts who are close to the business, people like Woodmac, who actually had geologists that worked for them, not, not um, stockbrokers. What were they saying? Interesting. Seismic imaging and production technology continues to improve dramatically. Deep water systems are being studied and understood at a global scale. And we're starting to recognize and understand the importance of stratigraphic traps in deep water. Again, we're still in two different worlds. Pretty amazing. But it's, the good news is it's not deterring the exploration community. This is what explorers do. They're going out and doing this stuff. Another decade or so, the discoveries just keep coming. Go figure. Now, by this time in the early 2010s, most everybody is saying, hey, the deep water leads the industry in value creation. It's pretty spectacular. But for a lot of the analyst community, that didn't last. Because 10 years, five years later, oil prices were back down and they were coming out of the woodwork again. It's over, it's too expensive, they can't make any money. At the same time, operators, deep water operators, are continuing to make discoveries to bring new fields on production and to develop extensions to existing fields, utilizing infrastructure. Again, they're still in two very different communities. Pretty amazing. Add another five or ten years, here we are, almost to today. Production keep, uh, discoveries keep going up. Today, I say pundits, it's most everybody. Deep water is the cheapest and greenest source of supply, of new supply. 
Deep water resources are critical to fueling the energy transition. Deep water production is set for continued growth. The same people that wanted to tell me in 2003 that the deep water was dead and buried are now saying that deep water production is set for continued growth. And my favorite, what's well, my second favorite? Offshore oil and gas is undergoing a remarkable renaissance. It's pretty okay. My favorite headline of them all from, from 2020, just to prove it, I got it. Oil majors focus on deep water pays off. If only I'd still been working for Shell and I could afford this to my bosses that I was trying to convince uh, decades earlier that that was gonna be the case, but no matter. Uh, it, that surely was my favorite. And then what's going on with the business? What are operators doing? Well, operators are continuing today to evaluate existing old and new plays. They're developing new technology. They're making really efficient use of existing infrastructure. And now this is a very important thing. It comes back to one of my themes for tonight. It's the oil business. Deep water assets are starting to make their way through the value chain. The large integrated companies are selling mature fields to smaller companies. They're going down the food chain and the smaller companies are now operating these things effectively, productively, and efficiently. And that will continue. This is the oil business. This is the same thing happened on the shelf, same thing happens internationally, same thing happened on short side. It's the oil business, go figure. And that's where we are. Now, it's worth, it's worth commenting a little bit, bring a little bit of realism back into it. it. This all looks very nice and it looks very good. It's not always that easy. You get to the point where you think it's about shooting fish in a barrel, you know, just, just out there for the, for the taking. And here we had in 1989 this very unique, interesting discovery at Mars. And then some people started drilling wells around Mars. Now, do these wells all represent one company's activity, Cindy? You don't have to name which one, but I believe they are. Uh, no. No. Uh, five so, of them were one company. One company. But, but, you know, people see this thing called Mars, which is pretty spectacular. And, uh-oh, I can't replicate it quite so easily, can I? Bang. And what happens after seven dry holes? Well, you stop. Something's not right. Two years in, and it's time to stop and say, look, we really don't quite know what's going on here. I think the one in the middle is Cindy, by the way. I got this slide from her. I asked if I could use it. We, we really don't know what's going on here. So what do you do? You do exploration. You step back. You look at the data you have. You take the space in apart. You put it back together. You apply the well control. And, and what happens next? Well, you know, Ursa is the next discovery drilled in the basin. And, and now you've got, um, you have a better understanding. You have better understanding of geology, better understanding of what you're doing. And no, it's not easy. And it, it comes with uh, occasionally uh, some pain, uh, sometimes some very expensive lessons, but that's how we learn. That's how we, that's how we do, uh, do the business. Oh, and by the way, um, in the deep water, it also comes occasionally with some fortuitous help. Uh, in this case, I'll say from the federal government. The Deepwater Royalty Relief Act of 1995 was pretty significant. It's, a, it's a, one of a few examples of, I say, I would call very effective, um, very effective uh, federal legislation. Uh, and the net positive, the net benefit to the federal government is, is measured by many, many studies in billions of dollars. When you take the, the royalties that weren't paid, but but then, on, but then in place of that, you had lease bonus, you got um, a, a somewhat smaller royalties, but you got taxes and everything else. Net benefit to the federal government has been pretty significant. So it's, uh, it's you know, there, there are examples where, where government help is actually pretty good. Now, back to economics. Look at it in the context of the oil business. Is the deep water expensive? Now, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because you, you can read the words. By the way, the answer is going to be no. Or more, more exactly, well, it depends on how you count, I suppose. Look, if one of my favorite indexes, I like, there are lots of different economic, by the way, I was manager of economics for Shell for a couple of years, so I claim to know something about this stuff. Um, the, um, 
there are lots of metrics that we use in this business. Finding costs, development costs, this thing, this index, this per barrel, this, whatever it may be. One that I like a lot is, is one, a, a term I think Mike Economides uh, coined it, uh, called activation index, which is how much does it actually cost to bring on a barrel a day of production? I like it because anytime I read a headline about what somebody's doing, some big development, some asset sale, some I can I can do the arithmetic in my head. Say, yeah, it's probably going to be a good deal. It's probably going to be a good venture. Ah, that one probably will work. Ooh, why why are they spending that much money? I don't get it. Right, whatever it may be. So when you look at activation index around the industry, now let's look at the industry. If I do conventional, very general numbers here, but they're real numbers from real things. So I, I I'm not making anything up. A mature basin, West Texas, Oklahoma, drill a conventional well. This is not shale, it's a conventional well. I spend a million to a million and a half dollars to drill and hook it up, and I'll deliver on the order of 50 barrels a day. That's okay. Activation index is twenty to thirty thousand dollars per barrel per day of production. If I'm drilling in shale, I'll spend eight to ten million dollars. IPs three five hundred barrels a day, activation index two to twenty to thirty thousand barrels a day. A new deep water development, okay, they are expensive if you count total dollars. I'll spend in a major new deep water development eight to ten billion dollars, but I'll deliver a, a production rate between two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand barrels a day, and an activation index twenty to thirty thousand per barrel per day production. And I mentioned deep water asset sales, there have been a few. And one recently, a company actually spent, they didn't say exactly how much, it's somewhere between one and one and a half billion dollars. And they bought 50,000 barrels a day of production. Activation index for them, 20 to 30,000. This is not a surprise. This goes back to, look, deep water can't live in a vacuum. And, and none of these things live in a vacuum. They're all very active. The industry is doing all of these things. They all have to compete with each other. And so it's no surprise they all come out about the same. Because if one of them were a whole lot higher, nobody would be doing it. By the way, if 20 to 30,000 a day sounds like a lot, we can compare it to a real, another real number, and that's enterprise value for the upstream industry. Enter, enterprise value, it's a financial metric. If I take market cap for a company, market cap plus debt minus cash, that's the enterprise value, that's what that company's actually worth in cash. The EMP universe, enterprise value, 47,000 per barrel per day of production. Anything I can do between 20 and 30,000 is a good piece of business. That's why we're doing it, no surprise. This is, so yeah, deep water's expensive because it's gonna cost me billions of dollars to do anything. But, and so I have to be well capitalized to do it. This is why it's, it's where the majors live. And I'll get big volumes in return. But in terms of sort of conventional metrics, how efficient is it, it looks like the rest of the industry. Now, why does deep water continue to work? Well, it's about technology. This is, this is the seismic line at Augur, the discovery well was drilled on. We saw amplitudes up against salt in deep water. And golly, that just looks like so many things we drilled on the shelf. We didn't know because we had a lot of experience in 1986. Yeah, 1986-ish. We, we, we had lots of experience drilling amplitudes that didn't work. So, you know, we didn't have a good sense of how to calibrate these amplitudes, but they were good amplitudes. Tom Hart, Chell would refer to these as hey lookies. He's a geologist when he would do, you know, let the GIFs do the thing. Just, hey, lookies. So we saw these great amplitudes, so we, we, we bought, we spent a lot of money in the 1984 area-wide sale uh, and bought a lot of acreage on spec. And, and this is one of the things that came from it. Uh, a decade or two later, we have these marvelous 3D seismic surveys with all the well tracks plotted, all of the amplitudes calibrated so that we know what oil get, looks like, what gas looks like, what water looks like, multiple layers, and, and we just do marvelous things with it. Another example, and these examples I pulled from, from the Deep Water book. This is one that, that Cindy provided. This is Thunder Wars. Time data on the left, depth data on the right. 
and depth, trace stack depth migration um, just a year later, but take the time to do it, and you see the salt find, you see the reflections underneath the overhanging salt, you can see much better continuity, you get a much better sense of what's going on. This is, this is advances in seismic. And, and the seismic, if you've been to any of the conferences lately, the seismic that gets shown today is just totally spectacular. Right? These are old examples, but, but they give a sense of, look, this is why the deep water works, because, because it's an industry that puts technology to work. And the technology doesn't end with, with the subsurface stuff. The surface engineers are doing pretty spectacular things, too. I showed Bullwinkle because it was the first of a, of a generation of deep water developments in 1,500 feet of water, and there's the platform sailing past uh, on its way out to the production site. Um, there are actually people standing out on this pier for scale. This thing is going to be set in about 1,500 feet of water, and in 1988. Oh, by the way, it's still producing today. There are those that understood the opportunity in deep water in 1988, and there are some that still didn't. There was a CEO of a major domestic oil company who, when this happened, he scoffed at it and said, how stupid can Shell be? They have just built the tallest building in the world, and they're going to occupy the top four floors. Well, he was right. But what he didn't understand was what we were doing with it and how we were putting it to work to make money to, to exploit an opportunity. And I, by the way, interesting, I added one slide today as I was thinking about this earlier. This is, this is a close-up. Technology is not technology by itself. Technology is about people. It's about the people you have and how you motivate them and use them. On the leg of this platform, so this is a, this is a close-up, sort of right up in here. On the leg of this platform, there, there are all these little well, I'm here I'm a geophysicist, so I would say, well, there are all these little gizmos. Well, the, gizmo, the gizmos are actually J-tubes and riser clamps and things like that. The engineer who was responsible for this, Pete Arnold, had, had his own set of insights. He didn't ask anybody who was responsible for the platform. Now, his job was to build this platform as smartly and efficiently as possible. But without asking anybody, he spent a few tens of thousands of dollars to add many more riser clamps and J-tubes on the legs of this platform than we would ever need for the Bullwinkle Field itself. Bullwinkle Field itself is not a pretty modest sized field. He put them on there because he'd been in the Gulf of Mexico for a long time and he, he said, look, there, there are bound to be some things around there that are going to want to tie back to this platform. And if I put these on now, we can do that. If I don't put them on now, we won't be able to do it. This platform will live and die with, with just the Bullwinkle Field. The economics would have been fine, but Bullwinkle Field itself has long been abandoned and the platform is still producing as a major production processing hub for the Deepwater Gulf of Mexico because Pete Arnold had the insight to hang all these riser clamps and J-tubes on the legs of this platform. Technology is about people. Right? It's, it's, not just, it's not just stuff. And, and where, where the production engineering has gone today is, is major subsea developments spread out over large pieces of geography, very, very um, different than, than what we did back then. So the deep water continues to succeed as I'm, I'm wrapping up now. Deep water projects done right are good projects. And I told you about good projects at the very beginning. Right? Technology is and always has been the enabler. It's a great multiplier for what you do. And it's the oil business. And there are very few things on this planet that are more profitable than a producing oil field. Finally, new technologies continue, and it's leading to greater efficiencies, improved economics, and, and developments that even a few years ago we didn't think would be profitable. I, I added one more slide late in this talk, and it was just this. I want a nod to the service industry, because the service industry is really a differentiator for, this is Halliburton and Schlumberger and, and, and the drilling companies, uh, Transocean and, and Diamond Offshore. They're a differentiator for the oil business in the United States compared to the rest of the world. Pretty significant. And, and they are also one of the service, because the service companies represent 80% of the hours worked offshore. So you, you can't ignore them. And did I just do something? Oh, no, it's back. 
And, and the service companies were in effect born from the oil and gas operators, but they now represent, the, they're the major technology implementers offshore. So they're a partner in all of this and, and they need to be thought about. Finally, there's this thing called the exploration black box. This is sli another slide I stole, stole from Cindy. Uh, I didn't tell her I was stealing this one, I just stole it. I, I figured this wasn't copyrightable. Now, when Cindy showed this slide um, the last time, she talked about the exploration black box and, and really talked about the how. The, the field studies, the wells, the putting it all together, the, the sort of the cerebral process of, of doing exploration. I got this in here because I, 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 I want to think about the who we are, the exploration, who we are. Um, and out of that come a couple of big ideas. The first of these big ideas, important ideas about who we are, we learn by doing and by telling stories. You know, there have been a lot of books written about exploration, about geology, geophysics, and the oil business. And sure, there are case histories and case studies and all that, but that's, that's not how we really are, learn. We, we learn by telling stories around the campfire. We learn by sitting down with, with the older guys and women who are going to share their experience with us. And, and out of that, we understand how, how the business really works. It's, it's paying attention to what the people before us did, why they did it, and what they learned from it, and how we move on. That's how you turn seven dry holes in the Mars Basin into uh, then a series of discoveries to follow on. And by the way, it happens elsewhere too. You know, how, how do you, how do you, I, I can go, I can go, hmm, strat traps in the mid-dip Tuscaloosa of Alabama sounds like a really interesting play. These are meandering channels, all I have to do is find North Dip somewhere, or strat trap closes off. Theoretically, it's a great play. And, and so, you know, one company that I happen to know well pursued it, and my gosh, it works. We drilled a discovery, followed by 42 dry holes. And it's, it's talking to the elders sitting around the campfire, learning from them, and you understand, why did we drill 42 dry holes? What did we learn from that? And what does that tell me about the next time I try to execute a strat, stratigraphic play in that kind of environment? So that's the first, that's the first important thing about the exploration black box. Second important thing about the exploration black box is um, if you look at the history of deep water and these conflicting messages, I said, these, look, these, you got the analysts, you got the geoscientists that, that living in two different worlds. If you're going to listen to people tell you about something, and this is exploration, this is geoscience, and you, you want to know who to believe, my advice. Find the people closest to the rocks and listen to them and believe them. Make sure they're sensible. They're not crazy, overly optimistic geoscientists, but, but they're, the ones, they're the ones you want to listen to. They're the ones that are they're probably going to be more right. And that's how the deep water has played out. Reading from Tom Hart. Years ago, when oil was $3 a barrel, this was written in 1988, we thought we could see the end. We speculated on who would be the last exploration production employee in the business. The general consensus was that it would be a tank gauger with a pickup truck, probably somewhere in West Texas. He would measure out the final drip and turn out the lights. This is probably wrong. I bet the last exploration employee will be a geologist with a pickup truck somewhere in Oklahoma. He'll chip off a piece of the Arbuckle crop, drive in a hurry to the nearest phone, call the rig and tell him to drill deeper. <laughs> now I think if Tom were writing that today, he would say, yeah, okay, maybe not Oklahoma. Maybe he looks at a core from the lower tertiary and, and contacts the rig that's drilling out in Keithley Canyon. But that, that's, that's exploration. In closing, one last thing, and then I am done. There was a guy at Shell I never met. I wish I had. His name was J.W. Pittman. J.W. Pittman, in the mid-1960s, was a production general manager for Shell in the Gulf of Mexico. J.W. Pittman was a media darling amongst the oil industry press, I guess that counts, uh, in 1966, because Shell had just done something pretty remarkable. We had set a platform in 265 feet of water. This was the deepest anywhere in the world. It's a world record. This is spectacular. 
And so people were rushing in to talk to J.W. Pittman about, about this accomplishment. And when he was interviewed, he said, yeah, okay, that's neat. I've done that one. What I'm more interested in, his quote, what I'm more interested in is talking about the future and, and the idea that one day we might be setting platforms in a thousand foot water depths a hundred miles from shore. That was J.W. Pittman in February of 1966. So I'll close with a quote from Mr. Pittman. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>